All right, so in the second part of section 5.2 in the Pierce text, we're going to talk about epistasis, and there's going to be quite a bit of information coming at you in this, uh, in this segment. So epistasis is where we see one gene actually masking the expression of a second gene. And this is similar to, in, to dominance, except that this is going to be between two different loci, not two different alleles. So the gene that ends up being the masking one is called the epistatic gene. And the gene that um, is masked is going to be called the hypostatic gene. So again, two more important terms relative to epistasis. Our hypostatic gene is going to be the gene that's masked or not expressed, and the epistatic gene is going to be the gene that does the masking. All right, so our epistatic genes um, are most um, visualized with Labrador retrievers, and we'll work through this expression pattern in just a few minutes. But um, our, our labs can actually be black, brown, or yellow, and the expression of that phenotype is really um, informed by two different genes, um, and those genes are going to be at two very different loci. So the, the B, um, or Big B is going to code for black pigment, and a little B is going to code for brown pigment. So those are the um, two alleles associated with the first loci. And then the two alleles associated with the second loci are big E and little e. So big E is going to actually allow dark pigment to be deposited in the shaft of the hair, whereas a little e is going to prevent the de um, the deposition of the, the dark pigment in the follicle of the hair. So our labs, um, um, again, come in three different colors. So our black lab is going to have the genotype big B, big E on the first and second loci respectively. And it doesn't matter what is in the position of that a second allele. Um, as long as there's a big B and a big E, those individuals are going to be black. So keep in mind that big B is going to be um, the dominant allele for the first um, for the first loci and that's going to inform the black color and the big E is going to actually allow that black color to be infiltrated into the hair follicle so that's why we end up with black labs our chocolate labs or our brown labs they are going to be homozygous recessive for the first loci so they're going to be little b, little b, and then the um, second loci, the e loci, is going to be big E, and then it doesn't matter what's in that fourth position or the second position for that second loci. So those individuals will be chocolate. And then our yellow labs, they tend to be pretty common, and that's because there are actually two different genotypes that can result in a yellow individual. So a yellow individual can have a big B on the first locus, but they are going to have homozygous recessive for the second E locus. And then um, our yellow labs can also be homozygous recessive on the first and the second locus. So if you notice here, it doesn't matter what really is in the position on the first locus, there is going to be a homozygous recessive genotype for the second lo locus of little e, little e, so those individuals are going to um, be yellow no matter what. All right, so if we work through some inheritance patterns, we've got our uh, parent generation up here at the top. So if we take a homozygous dominant um, phenot or dominant individual, breed that to a homozygous recessive individual, we know that our F1 generation is going to be 100% heterozygous. If we then allow those individuals to interbreed, then our F2 generation breaks out into a 9331 uh, genotypic ratio. So all dogs are going to carry genes for the black or the brown trait, but they're not going to be expressed unless they're accompanied by a big E. If they're accompanied by two homozygous little E's, it doesn't matter what is at that first locus, those individuals will be yellow. 
right, so as we start looking at the possible genotypes again uh, for our chocolate labs, they are going to be homozygous recessive at the first locus. Doesn't matter what's at the second locus. Our black individuals are going to be um, are going to have a big uh, dominant allele at the B locus and the dominant allele at the E locus and it, then it doesn't really matter what's at the second allelic position for each respective locus. And then our yellow labs um, are going to be homozygous recessive little e little e at the second locus and that little e little e genotype is actually preventing um, black uh, color to be deposited in the hair follicle. Therefore, all of those dogs are yellow. All right, so let's switch gears a little bit and talk more specifically about um, dominant epistasis. And this is um, best visualized with the example of summer squash. So in our parent generation, if we have a white squash and we um, cross that with a green squash, we're going to get 100% heterozygous um, individuals in the F1 generation, and they're going to be all white. Then if we allow those um, white squash to intermate in the F1 generation to produce the F2 generation, we come up with a real funky ratio. So... Um, so uh, a, a 12 to 3 to 1 ratio to where most of the individuals are still going to be white, but there's going to be a certain percentage that are going to be yellow and a small percentage that are going to be green. So the reason that we get that funky ratio is because of the dominant epistasis. So the three quarters of the plants are actually going to end up being white. And the reason for this is because on the that allele, the white allele, a big W is going to inhibit color to be deposited. And that is going to be a, the dominant allele. The recessive allele is going to be a little w, and it is um, in the recessive homozygous form, it is going to allow color to be expressed. So with um, the second locus, we're look, that we're looking at is the Y locus. So a big Y is going to be dominant to a little Y. A big Y is going to make a yellow pigment and then a homozygous little Y, little Y is recessive and that actually makes a green pigment. So just hang with me here. There's a whole physiology reason that this is actually going to happen. But before we get there, let's look at the different genotypes that um, are going to come together to um, determine what the the color of the squash is. So first of all, as we look at that white genotype, um, some things that you should be noticing here is that it doesn't really matter what is in position um, two of the first allele or um, either position of the second allele because as long as there is one big W in, in that first loci, that individual is going to be white because it's going to prevent any color from being deposited in the chlorophyll. So as we look at the genotypes associated with the green um, squash, that is going to be our homozygous recessive genotype. And then our yellow squash is where we're going to see the homozygous recessive little w, little w for the first allele showing up um, with a squash phenotype and then also there's going to be a big yellow um, or a big Y allele in at least one position of the second loci. So the homozygous uh, WW allows color to be deposited in the chlorophyll and the big Y determines that that color will be yellow. All right, so it's important to think of our epistatic and our hypostatic gene. So keep in mind, our epistatic gene is actually doing the masking, and then the hypostatic gene is doing is the um, gene that is actually covered up or being masked. So our epistatic gene is um, is going to be the white. Um, or is going to not be the white allele. It's going to be the W allele, the first allele, and the second allele is going to be the hypostatic gene. 
So again, here's our phenotypes, sorry. Here's our um, genotypes that go along with our phenotypes again. All right, so what is actually happening here? So it's important to kind of bring the, the genotypic information together with, with what's actually happening at a physiological level. So within squash families, there's going to be um, three different compounds that are going to be made. And these compounds are going to be the result of an enzyme being upregulated, activated, and then going to work to convert these enzymes from A to B and then from B to C. So this um, physiology is actually mapped out in this figure for you. So with our white squash, they are exhibiting compound A. So if the plants have a homozygous recessive little w, little w genotype on the first allele, then they're going to make enzyme 1. And enzyme 1 is going to allow compound A to be um, catalyzed into compound B, which allows the green pigment to be deposited. So keep in mind, if we have a dominant big W in any position on that first allele, enzyme 1 is not going to be upregulated, therefore those squash will remain white. So if we look at our now green squash, it is full of compound B, and if we have a genotype for at the second loci, locus, and we have a big uh, y at any one of those two positions on that plant, that is going to inform and code for enzyme 2. And enzyme 2 is going to take compound B and cleave it into compound C, which results in the yellow color being deposited in the chlorophyll. So keep in mind, if we have um, a genome that is homozygous recessive, little y, little y at the second loci, then enzyme 2 won't be made at all. Therefore, that um, green color will stay and the phenotype will then be green and um, just keep the compound B color. So that's actually what is going on at the physiological level. And so just keep in mind, this is an example of dominant epistasis where one gene or W is controlling whether the second gene um, is actually going to um, show up or not. Alright, so as we are continue to work through epistasis, just keep in mind that recessive epistasis is, um, is what um, labs have, so where the little e, little e genotype masks that first allele, and squash is going to be dominant epistasis. So really quickly, let's talk about duplicative recessive epistasis, and this can be seen in the trait of albinism in snails. So very similarly, our duplicate recessive epistasis is um, where a pigment is actually made as part of a two-step process, similar to what we saw in squash. So the A locus is going to actually make enzyme 1, which converts compound A to compound B, and the B locus is going to make enzyme 2, converting compound B to compound C. And it's only when we have the correct genotypes um, to get compound C that the brown color will actually be deposited um, for those snails. So duplicative recessive epistasis. And here's how our phenotypes, or our genotypes actually play out. So our albino snails are going to be crossed um, in the parent generation. All the F1s are heterozygous and have pigment. Then if we allow them to intercross in the F2, we get that same 9331 ratio again. But the phenotypic ratio was quite odd. 9 out of the 16 snails are going to be pigmented, and 7 out of the 16 um, snails are actually going to be albino.